Next, uh, we're going to turn to Dan Miller. Uh, Dan is a research microbiologist with USDA ARS, and he's interested in topics such as nutrient transformations and gas emissions from manure impacted environments. Okay. So, um, first off, I'd like to acknowledge the other folks that helped contribute to this work. Uh, Mateo is a postdoc uh, working with uh, Dan Snow, also at uh, UNL. And um, we got interested in this topic because, uh, well, there's just been a lot more uh, questions about how livestock and microbials may be affecting processes in the environment. Uh, certainly, there's a public fears and perception uh, and concern in the scientific community with all the antibiotics used in livestock, uh, what, what's going on with these uh, compounds in, the, in an environment. And these were just some of the headlines I grabbed from when I was originally preparing this uh, presentation a few months ago. And uh, you can certainly see that uh, antibiotics are on a lot of folks' minds. So I think it's really a, uh, an emerging field, uh, but it's a complicated field because you're, you're trying to uh, balance efficient animal production, disease control, and uh, animal welfare. I mean, if you withdraw antibiotics from, from uh, treating animal diseases, then you'll have animal welfare issues. So this is, it's, there's something that uh, we need to find a balance on uh, if we're gonna use these wisely and prudently. So why uh, largely the focus has been on antibiotic resistance. So these are, bacteria uh, that acquire resistance elements. So the thought is, is that with overuse of antibiotics in livestock, you have higher incidence of antibiotic resistance in manure. Uh, potentially when that manure goes into the environment, you can have horizontal gene transfer or even within the gut of the, the animal itself, but certainly in, in the environment, those genes and those the bacteria can move around. Uh, and eventually, the big risk course is human exposure and disease. The humans get, uh, pick up a bug and suddenly they're, they're uh, unable to treat it in the, the uh, most prudent typical way. So uh, the important thing is, is this, this all makes sense scientifically, but there are many gaps and understanding how important some of these linkages are can help us determine whether existing uh, use of, of livestock antimicrobials is affecting human health? That's the that's the big question. Or is it human use of antimicrobials? Or is it pet use of antimicrobials that are affecting human health? There's a lot of big questions. Um, so what about the antibiotic residues? This is something that's often um, it's not a, a research quite as much as the antibiotic resistance genes. So it's important to kind of keep those two two ideas separate. Most of the antibiotics are excreted from the animals, and um, some studies find increased in antibiotic resistance uh, residues in the soils. Sometimes they don't increase. Sometimes the residues break down rather quickly, or they can persist. And uh, finally, transport can uh, actually be uh, observed it with some types of compounds, while other ones will just bind as tight as can be to the soil particles and will not move at all, and perhaps are not bioavailable to the bacteria to cause antibiotic resistance. So uh, the question that I have, and that we all had with, when we started this project, is if you get enough antibiotic in the environment, um, would certain important ecosystem functions be affected by like decomposition, nutrient trans transformations, like nitrification, denitrification. Uh, what about gas emissions? We you find certain gas emissions being affected. So we wanted to try and describe this process in some initial experiments, and uh, our thoughts going into it is, is that maybe there's a threshold. Depending upon the soil you have out there, you're fine up until you reach a certain point, and then suddenly you've shut down say denitrification, or you shut down methanogenesis. Um, that we wanted to really kind of see if, if that was the case or not. It is likely dependent upon the type of antibiotic, because these antibiotics affect lots of different uh, types of processes. Some are very broad, uh, uh, broadly effective in that they 
are more antimicrobial than actually antibiotic. Other ones are very specific. They target a very specific protein. They shut down that protein, and that's how uh, they have their effect. And um, one question that we're going to get in more and more is, does the previous soil history have an, have an effect on this? Because you can certainly envision that there's lots of different soils out there that get different levels of antibiotic from, let's uh, say, livestock manures. So our experimental design was to do a serum bottle soil slurry type of study. Soils were from a, uh, a pasture that received a, a feedlot runoff. Um, so it had antimicrobial in it, and in addition to that, lots of nutrients, lots of salts, other things like that. Uh, based upon some work we'd done on a similar system, we came up with an artificial runoff media. And that we could spike in with different levels of antimicrobials. And we selected venensin, lincomycin, and sulfamethasin. And we looked at four different levels. Three conditions that we wanted to look at, because the soil's not, not necessarily always aerobic. Sometimes you can get a, a, the, the soil inundated and it'll go anaerobic. Another uh, common condition is that there's some nitrate uh, uh, around, you can have denitrifying conditions for a short period of time. We also did triplicate replication on these uh, serum bottles, and we measured a number of different things, including fermentation products. So we looked at all the fatty acids and the alcohols and aromatic compounds that might be produced during decomposition. We looked at headspace gases to see if there was particular gases being produced. And we are holding samples back to do some antibiotics. We have the LC method we're still waiting on some of that data because we're interested to know if the antibiotics themselves are sticking around or are they breaking down over time. That's part of the puzzle too. So with the artificial uh, runoff media, um, we, I developed that from a study we did at a uh, beef feedlot here uh, in central Nebraska where the animals uh, you know, are, are produced here in these uh, paddocks and any runoff collects in basins and then the basin liquid would be uh, applied to this, this uh, field adjacent to the feedlot. And we were at this site for three years, and so we had three years of runoff data, and so we could really take a look at, at maybe tailoring this artificial media to, to, to match what material came off of the feedlot. And it was usually, uh, uh, as opposed to say a runoff basin, which would collect water for quite a while and then eventually be applied after a month or two, this material was applied within three to four days after the rainfall event. So it was pretty fresh, hot stuff. And so the artificial runoff media had kind of your, your uh, 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 typical composition of lots of nitrogen compounds, uh, phosphorus and sulfur, and some other things that were coming off in, in the uh, liquid. And so the results, and I'm gonna present them a, a kind of a, a chunk at a time here and usually in complicated graphs, <laughs> but um, I just want you to kind of look at, at the broader picture of what's going on here. So for instance, here's the, the three different conditions, aerobic, so lots of oxygen around, fermentative, the, they've been growing in a nitrogen headspace, and then denitrifying where we spiked in nitrate to initially uh, give them uh, uh, that electronic sector. And we have menensin here, lincomycin, sulfamethazine at three different levels and then the negative control at zero. The important thing to look at here is, say under fermentative conditions it's most clear, you have at highest levels of menensin, you actually shut down the production of CO2. Similarly, under denitrifying conditions, you actually have some CO2 production going on, but then it shuts down once the nitrate is consumed. Um, Looking at methane production, under the fermentative condition, you get lots of methane being produced, but at the highest levels of menensin, you can see uh, it is reduced. Here, under the aerobic conditions, you can see that there was a gap here in sampling for about a week. Conditions went anaerobic, and that's why we got a little bit of methane. What's the time scale here? Oh, time scale is days. Sorry, that didn't come through when I had that. So this is a short period of incubation. Um, and so also under denitrifying conditions, once the nitrate ran out, of course it went further anaerobic and you had methane being produced. So you have 
consistent with the, these results here, low levels of methane being produced. So, so high concentrate, higher concentrations of menensin seem to shut down the production of, of methane, which is what you see in animals. So that's not too surprising. Nitrous oxide is a bit more complicated. Probably the easiest one to look at here is this, this uh, fermentative and the denitrifying conditions. Nitrous oxide is going to be coming from nitrate, um, mostly during uh, kind of a denitrification, or can also come from uh, during nitrification, aerobically. So most of this stuff here is coming through with denitrification. And in some instances, you can see it reduced. And here, if you look at the scales, you have some very different scales here to also look at. But the important part here is you can have some of them where there's no nitrous oxide being produced, mainly menensin again, um, or even it's, it's quite a bit reduced here under fermentative conditions. So pulling this all together into something that actually makes sense. Menensin reduced the anaerobic decomposition and methanogenesis at 500 uh, part per billion level, so we didn't see quite as much CO2 and methane. It inhibited decomposition at 5,000, so a very, very low CO2, CO2 being produced. And it also inhibited denitrification and aerobic uh, nitrous oxide production at the 500 and 5,000 part per million level. Lincomycin had some uh, uh, effect on nitrous oxide produ production under the aerobic condition, but only at the highest concentration. No effect on denitrification. Sulfamethazine, similar to the lincomycin, it inhibited denitrification of aerobic nitrous oxide production, but only at the highest level. Okay, taking another half of that equation of the, the, the different micro microbial products being produced and looking at the organic compounds. So this is mainly total volatile fatty acids, and of course your different uh, treatments here. Where you see methane being shut down, well, you see an increase in the total volatile fatty acids. So volatile fatty acids increase. So it seems to be shutting down that, that final bit of the process. Uh, similar, similarly, uh, total BFA in the fermentative condition, highest levels of uh, menensin here produces the most volatile fatty acids. Same thing. So increased concentrations of BFA found at the highest levels of uh, menensin under all three conditions. The others don't seem to have an effect at those various levels. So in summary, menensin at 500 parts per million seems to affect all gas production, stronger inhibition at 5,000 parts per million. Uh, so if we saw those levels in soils, that could be a problem if you were think that you want to keep uh, some decomposition processes going. Um, incomplete decomposition in all treatments uh, to the BFA, so a little bit more BFA being built up. Menensin is more of a generalist, so it affects the uh, integrity of the uh, membrane of bacteria, so this makes sense. If you're trading off electrons and you're making CO2 and you're making methane, usually that process happens in the cell envelope of bacteria. So it's, it's affecting a lot of things that way. Specific antibiotics don't seem to have quite the effect, at least the two that I looked at. The, the highest levels didn't seem to work. And there's uh, evidence for gradual and not a threshold in, inhibition. So at 500 parts per, per billion, we saw some, some inhibition uh, with uh, menensin. And at 5,000 is when we saw it completely shut down. So it wasn't like we hit a certain spot and we got into trouble. So what? So with sulfamethylene and lincomycin, what we saw in that original study of the feedlot runoff, it was typically low part per billion levels in feedlot runoff. And it's, we never detected it in soil. Menensin transported easily at this site, so we could actually, when we applied, say, clean water to, to that uh, spray field, we could see menensin coming off of the, the soil if there had been a recent application of, of uh, wastewater. So what this sort of summarizes is that, is that information. So we had 29 uh, instances where we collected runoff 
And in all 29 of them, we always saw them in Henson. We saw them in Lincoln less frequently. This is just the runoff. Average concentrations, and then the highest concentrations we detected. So when I was looking at 500 parts per billion and 5,000 parts per billion, that's a bit more than what we see even in the hottest uh, uh, liquid runoff that we can see from uh, a normal capital cap When we went back to that same pasture at the end of the season, took soil samples. We never saw uh, either sulfur methylene or lincomycin. We only saw them in Ensign very infrequently, 14% of the time. And the highest concentrations was 12 parts per billion. I think I have that right. That grams per grams per billion. So 12 parts per billion, which is quite a bit lower than, say, even the average concentration here that we see at 87. So if Men if is going out there, uh, it's probably getting broken down fairly quickly. It is mobile. Menensin does make a nice uh, kind of a tracer. So if you're looking for chemically not runoff or evidence of that, Maybe Menensin is a good thing to look, look at. Um, but in this case, it seems like the evidence is, is pointing us to it not being a problem. So for future directions, we want to incorporate nitrification into this evaluation. We've already set up the assay so that we can take a look and see what, how these antibiotics affect that. We also want to establish more realistic soil incubations. This was a soil slurry study, not your, not your typical soil incubation study. So we've got some good ideas about how we want to establish that. And we'll do some follow-up incubations this, this summer doing that. We also want to do some microbial community analysis. We've got folks who are willing and able to come in and take a look at antibiotic resistance. So we can try and, and uh, match up both the antibiotic residue remaining in the system and also its effect on, uh, on resistance. And then we also finally want, we want to go in and we want to contrast high, moderate, and low impact soils. So this is kind of a, here we can collect some feedlot surface material. This stuff is always getting dosed with antibiotics. It'd be interesting to see how it performs relative to, say, here's this area here that we're receiving runoff, and compare that to, say, a, a native grass prairie that doesn't get a whole lot of livestock on it. With that, those were the sources of funding. Ryan McGee and Madison Jerkins were to uh, the support people that help get a lot of this work done. And so if you have any questions, I'm glad to answer them. We have uh, two or three minutes here for questions, so. Yes. Uh, when you look at the, the antibiotic residues in your trials, are you going to look at breakdown products as well? Uh, that is a big, uh, big can of worms. Yeah. Um, Probably not. Uh, I did have a student who was looking at just tetracycline, and that was, became quite an involved project because you, you know that you know, it's lots of lots and lots of different, different things. So um, there's a couple of lines of attack that we're going to do with the, the looking at the antibiotic residues when we measure them. One thing going for us is it's the high concentration, so we don't necessarily have to resort to GC mass spec to, to measure really low concentration. Or I'm sorry, not GC, but LC and SMS. So that's that's one thing kind of in our favor. So we're hoping to, to just do standard LC analysis and be able to pick out those major peaks and see them so go, down, go up or down or stay. But not the actual breakdown products. Additional questions? Dan, I wanted to ask, uh, you, you chose to look at the, the runoff did you feel like these uh, uh, antimicrobials uh, are going to be water soluble? Uh, and what would you expect if you looked at a field that had been receiving uh, the, the scraped salt? So these three uh, actually span a range of being very soluble to relatively insoluble. And so um, we were wondering if, if when we saw some of our results, we might be able to attribute that to, to ones that were found in the soil for some time. Um, I do think you could see some, some effect of, of, the, of that if you were looking at fields where just the, the soils from the feedlot pens were going. Um, we were doing this runoff because we had a little bit of a, a 
of a history of doing the work on it, and she kind of knew what to expect and how to manage it. And it's, and it's just easier to, to do those kinds of experiments. But that would be a great kind of a next step to take once we get more of this work done, is look at the solids. We'll write down that assignment for when you get home. I will get right to it. <laughs> okay. Any last questions? All right. Thank you very much, Dave.